Hey, uh, good morning. Welcome to uh, another session. I'm Brent Palmer, Manager of Measurement Technology for CRT Services, and we are continuing our series in measurement. I lost my mind for a second. It's a Monday morning after a, a little bit of a holiday. So we're going to go into today on proving reports and specifically kind of the calculations behind how both mass and volume proving reports are done. So if you have any questions, uh, please jot them down, put them up in the, uh, the chats. At the end, we'll have a little question and answer session. This is going to, this, this, uh, this portion assumes that you already understand proving, what the concept is behind proving, uh, where we're doing a calibration of the meter and verifying the, the volume or the mass that is going through the meter against a certified device or a calibrated device, I should say. But what we're going to look at specifically is on that proving report, how are the numbers generated, what are the numbers, and how do we add up and actually create this new meter factor that's derived on these proving reports, and what information should actually be on the proving report. So rather than bore you with a, a bunch of PowerPoint presentations in this, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at uh, some actual proving reports. So we'll go ahead and get started, and let me pull up a, uh, a proving report. So this is going to be a compact volume proving report and just some better general information. Now, you may see some, some reports that look different. The layouts may be a little bit different and there may be some more or less data on them. There is a requirement of how much data should be on them. Uh, it's defined by API. But uh, a lot of information can also just be uh, generic information, uh, good to know information, nice to have information, and we'll go over kind of what's what's needed and what is uh, kind of nice to have information. So what we need on the ticket or on a proven report is the ability to, uh, to generate the same number, to be able to do the math and apply the math and generate the same number that the flow computer or the software that uh, created this proven report was able to generate. Now there may be some things that off to the side that are side calculations for the effects of temperature and pressure on the steel or on the liquid that are done in algorithms that the math is not presented on here, but the result of how the result of that CTL in that CPL calculation is on here because that affects the volume that's calculated for the meter and the volume that's calculated for the prover. So again, we're going to deal with volume here. Density comes into play, and we're also looking at the effects of temperature and pressure on the liquid. When we do a mass proving report, we will see that we don't have really an effect of temperature or pressure. There is none on the liquid because it's mass, and the only effect is really the, the, the effect of temperature and pressure on the steel of the prover itself. So in this case, if we start up, we do want to have the date, the time, and it is a good idea to have a report number, a way to track back into the device, the software, the flow computer, uh, the audit trail, or the, uh, the history trail of this specific proving report. I want to be able to go to the device and pull this report out if it's still retained inside of it and match it up with the report I'm actually see, seeing in front of me so that we, we can validate the numbers that are in there. So on this proven report, we had the date, again, the time, the report number. We've got the location. In this case, there's not a location filled out, but the location's generic as far as could be whatever the customer calls the location or whatever the company calls the location. The device itself it can be the flow computer. It can be the, uh, the software that's manufacturing the proving. It could be the company that's coming out to do the proving. Again, this is just uh, tag data or data uh, descriptive data to give you some more information about the system and location and so forth of where it's being proved. What's important next though is the prover data itself. So this prover data, if I'm using a uh, ball prover, compact prover, I'm typically going to get this information from the manufacturer or if I uh, had this prover for a while, the company that is coming out and doing my calibration or my water draw, they will fill out a water draw certificate on that water draw certificate. It will also have all this information. My, uh, my diameter of the tube, uh, my expansion coefficients, my rod coefficients. So the, the rod will be on a compact prover. I may have a rod coming out of it and it's the effect of temperature or it's the effects of temperature on the steel. So it, 
that obviously can shrink or expand, which affects the volume a little bit. The wall thickness of the tube, what uh, the product that's running through, in this case, they're using Table 5.6, uh, the 1980 version. And this is uh, crude oil, which this is just the name of the product here. And then the modules of elasticity for expansion and contraction. So these are the, the, uh, the base numbers that are being used. Uh, th there are some standard numbers depending on the, the type of steel that's used, whether it's stainless steel, whether it's nickel, and uh, there's different coefficients that you will use. And the flow computer or the software is going to use those in its calculations for the effects of temperature and pressure on the steel itself. Now the meter data, obviously we would like to have the meter serial number. So that way you know the meter that I'm proving, here's the serial number that's stamped on the side of it, and this information is, is for that meter. Why do I want to have that information on there? Well, as a, uh, somebody who is a seller of the product, and I'm doing provings on my meter. I want to be able to present that documentation to show that I have done regular calibrations of my meter, and here's the results of those calibrations. As a purchaser of that, if I'm doing an audit of their system before I want to come witness that, I want to make sure that the report that they're giving me actually is the report for the physical meter that's installed, and I'm able, again, to kind of trace that data back and forth. So the rest of the information is kind of... Um, just uh, for, for your own general knowledge, the meter, uh, what the name of it is for that location, the manufacturer, in this case, FMC, what the size is, what the model of it is, and also what the non-resettable totalizer or the gross uh, barrels are at the time of this proving. So I wanna know how much flow has gone past this meter since the last time I have a proving report off of it. There's some guidelines behind how frequently you should be proving a meter, but this will give you an indication, obviously, if, uh, if my GV totalizer was at 197, then I know that, you know, basically almost a million barrels have passed through this before it was proved again. That's probably a little bit too long. The size of the meter, in this case an 8-inch meter, has no impact on the calculation. Again, it's just for description purposes only, it doesn't come into any of the calculations here. So uh, if there's nothing left there, then that's typically okay. We are gonna see there should be information for the previous meter factor. So this is the meteor, meter factor that I am looking at when I do some comparisons for some information that's gonna be, uh, come on the proven report. I'm gonna look at the previous meter factor, what flow rate that meter factor was at, and then the date and time of that last proving. We can see that this proving was done on the 9th um, at uh, 8.35. So with proving, what we're doing is we're trying to get some consecutive runs. And typically, we'll have a number of passes maybe in a run, but I may just have one pass per run. Um, in this case, we can also have a uh, number of consecutive runs in our criteria, uh, five. I want to see five consecutive runs within a certain percentage, uh, typically 0.05%. And as long as I see that, then I have a, a good successful run in repeatability. Doesn't mean that my factor is any good. It just means that between the first run here from high to low on my counts, if I'm doing it by counts, that from high to low, that my repeatability between those is within 0.05%. The other information I have going on here is each run I'm looking at the flow weighted average for the course of that run for the meter, temperature, the prover, the meter pressure, the prover pressure, what flow rate it was at, what the density was at, and what the average frequency. What I care about really is the counts. What are the total pulse counts within that? And then I do my next run, my next run, my next run, and again, I have average information along with the, the total counts for that, and based upon that, I will come up with a repeatability based upon the counts. I don't care about temperature and pressure um, for each one of the runs as far as determining the repeatability. The repeatability is either going to look at counts, depending on how it's set up, or it's going to look at a meter factor that's derived for each one of these runs and, and look at the repeatability between the meter factors for each run. So I need this information. Obviously, if I have a zero here and a 48 here, that's not good. If I have too much of a differential between the meter temperature and the prover temperature, that means I possibly could have a leak going on, 
or that I have uh, the prover's too far away, it's not insulated, but because I want to try to keep the meter at the same condition the prover's at. I should be within half a degree, um, sometimes a degree, depending on what you're doing. The same way with the pressure, I don't want a really high pressure and a big differential between the, pre the meter pressure and the prover pressure. So I come up with these runs, and at the end of the runs, I come up with some averages that I'll, that I'll put down here. So the average of uh, pulse or the average pulse count for those five runs is um, here. The average temperature for those five runs, for the prover, for the meter, for the, the pressure for the meter and the prover, the average flow rate, the average density. Now I am going to use these averages when I start coming up with my calculated volumes. But what you'll, again, the, the counts, what I'm really looking for is, um, you know, what did, what did I think the total volume through that, uh, that proving was for each one of those runs? And then what are my deviations through here? So during the course of this, I have an average K factor. And again, I came up with my percent difference. So I'm within 0.05%. So that means my high to low was good here. Now I can go through and I can start calculating my data. So in calculating my data, the first thing I'm going to do is based off the water draw certificate, I'm going to have a base prover volume. So this was my calibrated volume. I'm then going to take into effect the uh, correction, and you'll see CTSP, the correction for the temperature, the effects of uh, the, P, uh, the uh, steel, and then the pressure for the effects. So I'm correcting for the steel. And then the next one I'm doing is for the liquid. So the, the correction for the, uh, the effect of uh, temperature on the liquid at the prover. The, and that's what the, the CTS, correction for the effects of temperature on the steel to prover, correction for the effects of pressure on the steel to prover, correction for the effects of temperature of the liquid at the prover, correction for the effects of pressure on the liquid at the prover. And I come up with those factors. And then you see the combined correction factor is nothing more than two times three times four times five. So I'm multiplying these lines up and that comes up with my corrected prover volume. So I've taken into consideration. Now, all of these numbers, the pressure correction factor and the temperature correction factor for the liquids were all derived from the table that's being used and also the density or the specific gravity of the liquid at the prover. Then you'll see I've got to take my meters. So I have a metered volume, which is nothing more than my pulses divided by my K factor. I have my meter density, in this case in pounds per cubic foot. It could be listed out in grams per cubic centimeter. And then I have my effect for the correction for the effect of temperature on the liquid of the meter, correction for the effect of pressure on the liquid at the meter. So my two correction factors, I multiply those together to come up with my combined correction factor using the meter density here. And then I multiply that times my metered volume and I come up with my prover or my meter, my corrected meter volume. I then take my prover volume, divide it by my meter volume, and that comes up with my meter factor, in this case a 0 0.9960. What's the deviation from the previous meter factor? A 0.03%. Typically, if I'm within 0.25 or 0.15% from my previous, and again, what we're looking for is we're coming up top to this 9999 and looking at the new factor that was derived, and this is my deviation. The results are, did I actually complete this? So did the whole proving sequence complete or was it aborted because of, uh, let's say, high deviation between temperatures between the runs or temperature between the meter and the prover went way up, the flow rate, flow rate was unstable, or the repeatability was bad? I have it set to be able to do, I have to do five consecutive proving runs, if those run, runs don't come in within 0.05%, within a certain amount, I might say my maximum is 10, then I could abort out on bad repeatability. So the results are going to tell me this was, repeat, this was successful. The other thing that I can put on here is my meter factor status. And the implemented means that that meter factor was then, this new 9996, was then implemented in the flow computer um, so I have that on my report. If somebody's there witnessing it, they can sign it, date it by the company that they have, and then 
that'll be uh, retained by the, the, the whichever company needs to retain it, or a copy of it is also inside the flow computer that generated this, this information out for the proving company. But this is my proving report. This is what I want to see when, uh, when I'm doing an audit. It's also what I want to look at when I have problems with provings. Um, again, this repeatability is looking at the repeatability of the runs. So that's one criteria that I'm looking at. But just because I get a good repeatability doesn't mean that I have a good meter factor. So that meter factor could come up. I could have good repeatability, but the meter factor comes up at a 0.1. And that could be a host of things from core density to a bunch of other things, a bad K factor here and so forth. Because if my K factor is way off, my meter factor can be way off. So K factor is basically telling me the, uh, the K factor that I have put in, that's my pulses per uh, unit, in this case, pulses per barrel. So if I put it in and start off with a crazy K factor, I'll have a really large meter factor or small meter factor because I didn't have a correct K factor to start off with. So that's the meter factor when we do with uh, volume. When we have a mass meter and we do a mass proving, you can see, and this is a little bit different, we still have uh, information on here. It's just in some different places. Uh, the prover, the manufacturer is a little bit different. There's a serial number for this one, but we still need to know our, in this case, material 304 stainless steel. What table are we using? Wall thickness. This is a 17 inch prover and our expansions and contractions and our modules of elasticity. Our meter information, they've chose not to, to fill it in, but they at least have what the, they call the meter in this FE 600 is the name for the meter. Now you'll see that they're recording not the volume, but the mass in kilopounds since the last time it was proved. So this meter, the last time it was proved was in January 22nd, and this is the flow rate at which it was proved, and this is the meter factor that was derived. Now, we're still doing a proving where we're doing counts because we're counting the number of pulses, but in this case, each pulse represents uh, so much of a pound of a product going through. We're still recording our meter temperature, our prover temperature, our rod, in this case also then our prover and meter uh, temperatures and pressures, the flow rates in kilopounds per hours. We still have our density and we have our frequency of the, the frequency coming in. This proved at a 0.04% repeatability, so the counts between the high and the low, what that repeatability came in at. And now at the prover though, what you're gonna see is we're only correcting for the expansion and contraction of the steel, the effects of pressure and temperature on the steel because we are, since we're in mass, we're not gonna do a correction um, of the liquid. We don't need to do a correction, we're measuring in mass. So I have my, my volume, my prover and barrels up here, and then I'm gonna convert everything into pounds and turn it into a mass. So my mass at the prover, was 84.49. I have my total pulses. If I have a body correction or viscosity correction that's in here, I have my K factor. This is 120 pulses per barrel. I have my density, which I really don't care about, but I come up with my mass and we do the same. We, subtract, we divide line five by line 11 and I come up with a new meter factor. Now, obviously this new meter factor, which is a 0.673, is, uh, is too far out from the previous meter factor of a 0 0.011. So that was quite a change. And if I look here, it says the prover sequence not completed. Why? Because the previous meter factor test failed. We looked at the previous meter factor, they have a criteria in there, and it said, you know what, that's too far off. If that's too far off, then don't implement the meter factor. So in this case, we know that that meter factor was not implemented in the flow computer automatically, but somebody still manually could go in and put that, that meter factor in, but it wasn't done automatically when the proving was completed. Now you can also do a reverse on this, where if you, have the, if you know the density of the prover and you know the density of the meter, we can actually turn this all into volume and instead of turning the prover, which is in volume to mass, we would keep it in volume and we'll turn the meter from mass into volume, and then we would do a volume to volume proving on this also. 
So just another way to do the proving. So I can do a mass meter by volume. I can do a volume meter just by mass and kind of mix them up. So you have a few options of, of doing your proving. So in this case, um, we've got a, uh, again, I've got a volumetric device that's proving a mass device, some of those. So that's what we do on this proving. We still have our proving number up here and uh, these provings are then saved, printed out and given to the customers. So how this is all configured inside the flow computer or all part of the parameter settings when we set up proving. Again, from our water draw, we have to know what are the expansions, coefficients, what are the size of the provers and so forth so we can do these calculations correctly inside either the flow computer or they can be done inside of the, um, uh, the software that's doing the proving for you from a proving company. Are there any questions on proving tickets, proving reports? And again, a lot of the math is, is already on these reports. But the things to look for is if I, if I don't have some commonality, if my difference between my meter temperature and uh, my prover temperature are way off, that's gonna affect my proving. If I have a large deviation in counts, that's gonna affect my repeatability and I'm not gonna get my repeatability. And I need me to do some basic troubleshooting steps of why I see such a difference in those. So, are there any questions? Please unmute your microphone uh, if you've got a question or uh, put it up in the chat. All right. Well, I appreciate everybody taking the time to, uh, to check out this live session. We'll have a couple more this week. I think we've got three more scheduled for this week on uh, some Flowex and some other uh, training uh, topics. If you have some ideas for training topics, please send them to me in, uh, at CRT and check our website for some upcoming trainings that we have. And also share the links for our videos. These videos will be posted up on our YouTube channel and the links for them will also be on our website. But if you go to the YouTube and just do a search for CRT uh, slash services uh, and look at our channel, all the videos that we've done so far are up there and they're available for use. Please uh, share them with everybody. And if you'd like to present a topic, please let me know and uh, we'll get coordinated where you can present a topic either live or we can uh, record a small topic that you're able to present. But hope everybody's safe out there and uh, thank you and have a good day.